or 20 and I will let you know uh, whenever you have only five minutes in the chat, okay? Uh, perfect, thank you very much. So let me share the screen. And uh, put full screen mode. Can you see it well? Everything is fine? Yes, perfect. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for, for having the, the paper uh, in the program. It's a joint work with uh, Gaston, Robin, Ratna, and Sylvia, uh, all from the IMF. Uh, and uh, let me start with a brief motivation for why we decided to start this project. So basically the motivation was, was uh, twofold observation. So first, uh, although the, the literature on drivers and consequences of capital flows is really vast and, and very deep, uh, typically uh, the papers tend to focus on the mean outcomes, on the factors driving the, the average flows, or if they consider tail episodes, they tend to do it using logit type models, which impose important constraints on how much you really can uh, analyze these periods. Uh, secondly, uh, we think that the, the, the existing literature somehow uh, somewhat understudies the role of policies. Uh, and in this context, I mean both direct effects of policies on, on flows, but also the indirect impact through which policies can affect how uh, adverse or positive shocks influence capital flows. Uh, and this is despite large and growing theoretical literature uh, on that uh, topic. So uh, our aim with this project is to um, use the um, approach that is based on uh, quantile uh, panel regressions uh, in order to forecast the entire distributions, uh, future the entire distributions of uh, future capital flows with a focus on emerging markets, uh, to do it over different time horizons and to uh, study the drivers of these entire distributions of future flows. Uh, and here I mean both global financial conditions and domestic structural characteristics and policies with a particular focus on how these two latter ones, policies and structural characteristics, affect the, the impact of global uh, changes in global conditions on capital flows. So in the empirical approach, we closely built on, uh, on so-called at-risk framework. Uh, which has been first proposed by Tobias Adrian and co-authors to study the drivers of uh, future distributions of GDP growth. So just to um, give you an illustration of how we approach um, studying capital flows in the paper, the chart here uh, shows uh, hypothetical probability density functions for some hypothetical uh, emerging market economy. So the black dashed line shows the density in some initial state. Uh, so the median flows are equal to 2% of GDP and the uh, black dashed area, to the left from zero, shows the probability of uh, outflows in this initial state. Now the red uh, density function shows the subsequent, subsequent state following some adverse uh, global shock, let's say which leads to shifting of the entire distribution of flows to the left. So the outlook for flows deteriorates, uh, the median declines, and also the probability of net outflows increases as reflected with this uh, larger now dashed uh, area uh, to the left from, from zero. Now, suppose that in this hypothetical economy, um, policymakers decide to intervene in order to mitigate the risks to future flows. And suppose they do it, for example, by, uh, by using FX sales. Uh, in this uh, hypothetical example that we have here, um, this results uh, in an improvement. This intervention results in an improvement for the, in the outlook for future flows. And this is what you can see in this second chart uh, where the blue density function corresponds to this uh, outlook for future flows. 
conditional on the adverse global shock and conditional on the use of policy intervention. So both the median flows improve and the probability of net outflows declines compared to the case with no policy intervention, which again is given by the, by the red density function. So in a nutshell, this is uh, what, what we will try to study in the paper. And to be more specific about the econometrics, uh, as I mentioned, we will use quantile local projections applied to a panel of emerging market economies. And with some abuse of notation, the, uh, the equation here shows the general specification that we will use. So the left-hand side variable stands for cumulative gross portfolio inflows in percent of GDP in economy I between the current quarter and uh, age quarters ahead. And uh, upper, upper script uh, alpha uh, corresponds to different percentiles uh, at which we will estimate uh, this, uh, this regression. And as you can see, we will uh, look at both external factors and domestic controls. And we will include an interaction term of, of the policies or structural characteristics denoted by variable Paul with these external, uh, external factors. So that's the first step uh, of our empirical approach. In the second step, we will take the estimates from equation one and we will uh, use these estimates to feed the empirical distribution of uh, future flows into a skewed T probability distribution, first proposed by Azzarini and Capitani in 2003. And the skewed T distribution is very attractive because it nests the normal distribution. And at the same time, it allows to, uh, to feed distributions that, that, uh, that have fatter or asymmetric tails. So to be a bit more uh, precise about the particular specification that we use in the paper, it is given by equation two. So uh, as I mentioned, we use, uh, we use uh, quantile uh, regressions on a panel of emerging market economies. And in the regressions, we focus on one uh, global uh, financial variable uh, to keep the model parsimonious. So this will be the changes in the US corporate BBB yield, uh, which can reflect a range of factors, including changes in the investor's risk aversion or changes in the monetary policy in the US. And we will consider domestic policies or policy frameworks one at a time uh, in order to increase the number of degrees of freedom at, uh, at the tail uh, quantiles. So in particular, uh, we would expect the coefficient beta one to be negative. So higher yield, uh, corporate yield in the US uh, to have a negative impact on, uh, on the left-hand side variable. Uh, and in this case, if the coefficient beta three on the interaction term between the BBB yield and domestic policy pol i is positive, uh, then it is uh, equivalent to the, monitor, uh, to the policy uh, that is considered reducing the impact of higher BBB yield on the percentile alpha of future portfolio inflows at a given horizon. So that will be the, the interpretation. Um, we will focus on portfolio flows uh, in the regressions. Um, and this is motivated by the observation that these type of flows tend to be more volatile and respond more to global factors than other types of flows. And we will uh, focus on gross inflows by non-residents as the post-GFC literature has stressed the importance of looking at, at the flows by non-residents and residents separately. Um, and that the flows by non-residents also tend to be uh, more volatile in response to global shocks. Uh, in terms of controls, uh, we will always include uh, domestic real GDP growth lag. Uh, to control for the global economic cycle, we will also control for the US real GDP growth. Um, we will include a measure of domestic financial vulnerabilities uh, as captured by the short-term foreign debt to FX reserves. And we'll control for uh, financial integration of a given economy with global markets. Um, our baseline sample will consist of 18 
EMs, for which we can compute our preferred measure of financial integration, which is based on Becker et al. Um, but in a robustness exercise, we will replace this financial integration measure uh, by financial development index and capital account openness, which will increase the number of a number of countries to 35. And the result will show the results to a halt. Finally, uh, when we replace the BB yield by the VIX index, most of the results also carry through. Okay, so uh, finally, as I mentioned, we will look at the impact of both uh, domestic structural characteristics and policy actions on how they affect the impact of global factors on capital flows. So in terms of policy variables, higher frequency ones, uh, we will look at monetary, macroprudential, capital flow and FX interventions. Uh, so the CFMs, capital flow measures, and macro pro policies uh, will be measured by binary action indicators. So plus one whenever there was tightening and minus one whenever there was an easing. Um, and in this context, uh, uh, and, and the FX interventions, whenever we don't have the official data on the size of interventions, uh, we use approach uh, proposed in, in, in the literature to estimate the size of, of FX interventions. So we recognize that policy actions are often deployed in emerging markets in order to respond to or to prevent large movements in capital flows. Uh, so therefore, to address the potential endogeneity issues that arrive from this, uh, we will use residuals from estimated policy functions for these four policy variables. Uh, as our measures of uh, policy surprises. So in other words, we'll have what we call first stage regression, where we will uh, regress uh, each of these four policy interventions on a bunch of macro financial variables. And then we will use residuals from these first stage regressions in our quantile regressions. And this is approach that has been already used in the literature. So next to the policy variables, uh, we will also consider uh, structural uh, characteristics. And uh, here we will uh, consider uh, exchange rate flexibility, financial development, rule of law, capital account openness, uh, central bank transparency, and arguably these measures um, are more slow moving and less prone to this endogeneity issue than uh, high frequency policy variables. Okay, so moving on to the results, we can present the results two ways. We'll do it two ways. So one is to just show the coefficients on the variables from the quantile regressions. So we will do that for three percentiles, the fifth one corresponding to low tail risks, for the median percentile, and for the 95th percentile corresponding to the uh, upper tail of the density of the future flows. Uh, and then we will also compute these predicted densities uh, of future flows that will allow us to uh, consider joint impact of the policy variables through the interaction term with the BBB yield and through the standalone term. So here we're starting with, uh, uh, sorry, here we're starting with just showing the impact of the BBB yield. Uh, and as you can see, a uh, tighter, a uh, tightening in global financial uh, conditions uh, leads to a uh, higher risk of capital outflows. So the higher BBB yield reduces the flows at these lower percentiles and has some impact on reducing also the median future flows in the short term. Now, if we move to policy variables, uh, we can see that um, uh, what we see here is the, the impact of the FX sales and monetary tightening uh, on, uh, on the future capital flows uh, in terms of uh, the impact through the interaction term with the BBB yield. So this is what the, what the lines here present, the, the coefficient on the interaction term. So FX sales uh, mitigate the downside risks uh, to capital flows. Uh, as the interaction term is positive and statistically significant and also have positive impact on the median flows. 
Monetary policy has some effect, uh, especially for the lower tail of the distribution, for the, for the lower quantiles. And here we present exactly the same results, but through these predicted density functions, both for the FX sales and for monetary tightening. So here we fit these uh, empirical distributions in the skewed T distributions uh, for cumulative four quarter ahead portfolio inflows, uh, conditional on, uh, on the one standard deviation increase in the BBB yield. Uh, for two cases. First, when there is no policy intervention, so those are the red uh, density functions, uh, versus the case when there is a policy intervention uh, corresponding to one standard deviation uh, intervention. So FX sale of 1.5% uh, GDP or a tightening of 200 basis points. So as you can see, uh, the FX sales have quantitatively important effects. The entire distribution shifts to the right following the sales. And we actually showed, we compute that the reduction in the probability of net outflows after such intervention uh, is equal to uh, 6%. So the probability of net outflows declines from 22 to 16% following a rise in the BBB yield. For the monetary tightening uh, intervention, however, the quantitative uh, effects are not, not that large, however. Uh, I know that I think I'm slowly running out of time. Uh, so let me very briefly go through the, through the uh, other results. So uh, we uh, run the same uh, regressions for the macroprudential policy shocks, as I mentioned. And here we find that actually macroprudential easing is very potent in terms of both reducing the downside risks and actually increasing the outlook for both median and upper percentiles uh, of, uh, of future flows following adverse global shocks. So this is reflected in this, the positive sign of the, the uh, coefficients on the interaction term with the BBB yield. In terms of the CFM tightening shock, we actually find a very interesting result that CFM tightening, if anything, is counterproductive as it actually tends to uh, amplify downside risks to uh, to capital flows following global shocks. So this is what you can see uh, here uh, for the interaction term for the fifth percentile where the interaction term is negative and statistically significant. And what it means that it might be some, there might be some leakages or signaling effects, which uh, mean that CFM tightening is really not effective in achieving its stated objectives, but has the perverse opposite effects. Again, one minute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, quantitatively, effects of macro pro easings are uh, are relatively large. Uh, macro pro easing uh, of one standard deviation reduces the probability of net outflows for outflows from twenty four to eleven percent. CFMs are quantitatively uh, important, but predominantly for the lower tail of the of the density uh, density of future flows. Um, let me finish with the results for the uh, financial development and the exchange rate regime. For the financial development, we find that in the medium term, the effects are statistically significant for both the tails and the median of the distribution. Uh, so we interpret it as saying that financial development imp improves the probability of reversal of, of, uh, of flows following an adverse shock. For the exchange rate regime, we find the interesting result that in the short term, larger flexibility of the exchange rate amplifies the, the tails, amplifies the volatility of capital flows. But in the medium term, at longer horizons, it actually only has a positive impact on the upper tail of the, of the future flows. And this is basically what you, what you can see on this, uh, on this chart which shows again this predicted densities uh, of future flows in the short term on the left-hand side and in the medium term, which is after two years, for countries with more rigid exchange rate regimes, red lines, and a more flexible exchange rate regimes. So after a shock, more flexible economies have predicted densities of near-term flows that have 
fatter tails, there is more volatility, but in the medium term, only this positive effect on the upper tail uh, remains. So let me conclude here. Um, I think uh, our paper, uh, the findings in our paper highlight the usefulness of, of the empirical approach that we propose of, of looking at the, at the entire density of future flows when analyzing the impact of policies. We find that several policies and policy frameworks uh, appear to affect upper and lower tails of distributions uh, and that these effects would have been missed uh, with standard methods. Uh, the results also highlight the complexity of policy making and relevance of country specificities. Uh, and it's, uh, the, the inter interpretation of the results is also that different countries may choose different policy mixes in the face of the same external shocks, for example, depending on their risk appetite or welfare functions. Um, let me stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Lucina. Uh, so if you have any questions, just please write it in the chat. And whenever Eddie present, I can I can read the, the questions to, to to Lucina and then we have we can have the discussion. Okay. So now we're gonna have a, the paper spillovers at the extremes, macroprudential tools and vulnerability to the global financial cycle by Carly Deals Steedman from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. So, so please go, go ahead and, and you have as well 18 minutes. Okay, um, you can see my slides? Perfect. Okay, so I'd first of course like to start by thanking the conference organizers. Today I'm presenting joint work with Anusha Chari and Kristen Forbes. I'm an economist at the Kansas City Fed, so the usual disclaimer applies. The title of our paper is Spillovers at the Extremes, the Macroprudential Stance and Vulnerability to the Global Financial Cycle. So let's take a second to unpack that title just a little bit. In the background of the writing of this paper, uh, countries around the world have over time implemented macroprudential policies more actively over the last decade in response to the last crisis. And to that effect, a growing body of literature on the effects of macroprudential policy on bank flows has found that these measures reduce the buildup of risks during good times uh, and mitigate their amplification during bad times. So they uh, appear to do what they're supposed to do. But at the same time, there's also a growing body of evidence that macroprudential policies can generate spillovers or leakages that shift risks elsewhere around the globe or within the economy. Carly, so sorry. Are you moving your, your slides? Uh, no, I'm still on oh. this. <laughs> still motivating. Um, so these leakages can include flows into uh, corporate bond markets or the broader shadow financial system, which uh, could be marked by different vulnerabilities, risk sensitivities, or regulatory landscapes. And so uh, in this way, macroprudential regulations could end up undermining rather than mitigating financial sector vulnerabilities. And so that brings us to the current context wherein we are all presenting from our respective homes, uh, which is that a bit more than a year ago saw the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, which set off a historically large risk off episode in, in capital flows. So it's in this moment that the effectiveness of policy intended to buffer shocks asserted its importance in practice to policymakers and in our collective attention as researchers. And this is when we should notice the effects of such policies. And it's in particular, policymakers need them to be effective during extreme events. And so to us, this episode highlighted a gap in the literature wherein there's little systematic analysis of spillovers and leakages from macroprudential policy over different phases of the global financial cycle. And so our paper fills that gap. Now is the next slide. Uh, here I'm offering some graphical motivation, which is just an illustration using our data. Here is uh, EPFR fund flow data as a percent of assets under management in the initial months of the coronavirus crisis, mid-February 2020 to mid-April 2020. And these are cumulative, uh, cumulative flows indexed to 100 in the week of February 17. On the left is equity flows and on the right is bond flows. 
And the first pattern to which I want to draw your attention is the precipitous level of outflows from equity and bond funds in the sample of 72 advanced and emerging markets included here. The second pattern involves the blue and the red lines. The blue line in this graphic is the cumulative index of flows for countries with some form of macroprudential policy in place, this blue line. The red line is the same for countries with less macro pru in place. So counterintuitively, and to the, to the question underlying this paper, countries with some macro prudential measures in place before the crisis actually fared worse than those without in terms of their portfolio flows. So this begs the question, how do macro prudential policies affect portfolio flows at different phases of the global financial cycle, like the iteration that we have just seen? But that evidence is anecdotal, and our work aims to take a more systematic look at these spillovers and extremes. So as I mentioned a moment ago, it should be in these circumstances, these extreme moments, that the effect of macro pre really shows itself. Um, by contrast, a lot of work in this area focuses on mean outcomes. So to that end, our paper joins a rapidly, body, uh, a rapidly growing body of literature that examines extreme events in capital flows, uh, like the one we just saw. Uh, which focuses on the entire distribution of realizations, in the case of our paper, the entire distribution of risk realizations, and which goes beyond average relationships that pertain only to normal times because we want to see that these measures are working in abnormal times. So by testing the degree to which uh, the macroprudential stance affects the sensitivity of portfolio flows at different phases of the global financial cycle, our paper adds substantial texture to the broader literature on the efficacy of macroprudential policy. Very briefly, we take a four pronged approach. First, we take care to measure the macroprudential stance uh, with a number of big challenges, with respect to a number of big challenges in literature. And uh, folks who work in this space uh, are aware of these challenges having to do with measuring the macroprudential stance. And we view, uh, our, um, we view our efforts at measurement as a major contribution from this paper. So we are mindful of the intensity of the tools, the breadth of the tools where they uh, act in the economy, looking uh, carefully across time and across countries, and then taking seriously the issue of endogeneity when measuring these policies using a shock-based approach, uh, which we also saw in the previous paper. Um, the second element of our strategy is in using high frequency global risk shocks, which are composed of a, an amalgam of asset prices, which are meant to capture different sources and provenances of risk over the, over the cycle, um, and which tries to capture the multifarious ways in which reactions to risk can manifest. Related to that, because we have a high frequency shock, we use high frequency EPFR country flow data on portfolio reallocations as our proxy for capital flows in order to ensure a tight temporal link between spikes in risk and investor uh, real-time decisions. But then recognizing that these don't have the same uh, uh, measurement philosophy as the IMF data on international capital flows, we supplement our analysis with that IMF uh, balance of payments data. And then finally, we analyze the impact of macroprudential policies on portfolio flows, both with and without regard to the risk environment, which uh, in the end proves really important for detecting new influence of macroprudential policy on flows, which we'll see shortly. So as a preview, we find that tighter macroprudential regulations by themselves do not appear to exercise a discernible impact on portfolio flows. And in this way, we find what the rest of the literature finds. But macroprudential policies amplify the impact of risk shocks on bond flows, particularly during stress episodes. And this is the, uh, this is the contribution of the paper in terms of measuring the impact of macropru uh, on flows. These impacts we find are modest near the mean values of the risk distribution, but they increase markedly at the extremes and asymmetrically so. Going more granular, we find that these are driven by tools targeting FX and the supply of bank credit. And then when we look at lower frequency capital flow measures, we find that the patterns are less robust, but they're broadly in, great, in agreement with our high frequency findings. And we do detect a significant mitigating effect of the macroprudential stance on quarterly bank flows in the face of a, of a risk shock. So this draws out uh, an important, if a little bit subtle angle on our mean results, which is that while our results support concern that macroprudential regulations can shift financial humiliation outside the banking system, 
we still have to weigh these leakages and their uh, and their amplification effects against the benefits of improving the resilience of the banking system. And both of those forces are elements that we find in this paper. But in either space, our work also suggests that the role of macroprudential policy varies across the global financial cycle, uh, which standard analysis has thus far ignored and which proves uh, important for, for detecting uh, the, the effects. So next we'll take a brief overview of the methodology. Um, the first element that we tackle in this paper is in spending a lot of time on being uh, intentional on measuring macro crew. So for folks who know this data, uh, you know the depth of this challenge and therefore a big contribution in the paper is in tackling three common issues within this literature. First, we measure the stance of policy rather than the, uh, the fact of having implemented a change. We also take care to capture the intensity of the policy, again, rather than the fact of a change. So giving some, giving some more texture than that plus, uh, plus one or minus one dummy. Uh, and then we focus on macroprudential tools, which focus on vulnerabilities in a number of sectors. And we try to give careful shrift to reverse causality and selection in recognition of the fact that vulnerability uh, to volatility and capital flows makes uh, a state more likely to enact macroprudential regulations. And we try to take care of this with a policy, shock, policy shocks approach. So I don't have a ton of time to go into depth. I'm already more than halfway uh, through my allocated time. But for interested parties, we use two sources of data on macroprudential policy. The first is the counter cyclical capital buffer from the ESRB and the BIS, which gives us a quantitative measure. Uh, of intensity. Then we also use the IMAP database from the IMF, which expresses changes in a policy area as dummies in the month of the change. So to get the overall stance and subcategory, we follow Bergantetal and uh, sum across indicators and cumulatively over time to get the stance of policy. Uh, and then the IMAP database also hopefully includes loan to value ratios uh, in the data set. And so that gives us another quantitative measure of macro probe. So our paper includes four different measures of the country level macroprudential policy stance, but we're going to focus today on the measure highlighted in blue, which is our preferred measure. And this combines the strengths of the available data sets. And uh, this is an equally weighted index of the CCYB, the LTV, and the FX macroprudential stance, which covers three important targets of macropro, bank exposures, housing exposures, and FX exposures. So next, let's take a look at the measure of risk taken from another paper that I have with Anusha Chari and with Christian Lundblad. The so-called RORO index captures realized variation in risk and risk appetite uh, across a variety of assets. So very briefly, we take the z-score of the principal component of daily changes normalized so that higher values is risk off in 15 series, capturing credit risk, risk aversion, funding liquidity, and, uh, and, uh, safe, uh, and uh, safe haven currencies. Um, the features of this index are visible in this time series here on the right. So again, these are normalized such that positive is risk off like the VIX. Our series is skewed toward risk off with very long tails. And we see very large spikes like those associated with the global financial crisis, the European debt crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, which are very large, but very rare. Um, so these are more than five standard deviations above the mean. And while most events fall within about a unit from zero, so one standard deviation, it's not at all uncommon for shocks to breach the two standard deviation mark. And these are the moments when countries would most fervently hope uh, for macroprudential policies to stem destabilizing flows. And so it's in that de extra destabilizing space where this paper lives. Our variables of interest throughout most of the paper are bond reallocations from EPFR country flows data. Uh, we focus on portfolio debt as a substitute for bank lending, but the paper does include results for equity flows and everything I say here today basically applies to them in the results. So the two primary benefits of the data set are that their weekly frequency, giving us that tight, that tight temporal link that I mentioned before. And the data set also is comprised of individual fund reallocation decisions from the fund flow and country weighting data sets, which gives us a cleansed measure of flows that doesn't have valuation and exchange rate effects embedded therein. Uh, it's important very briefly to note that these are not the same concept as cross-border capital flows because they represent portfolio reallocations among funds. Uh, but again, we use the IMF data to corroborate our findings in the traditional capital flows space. 
Uh, for our controls, we use standard push and pull controls from the literature on capital flow determinants. After including these controls, we have a sample of 55 emerging and advanced uh, economy countries. And um, because they play a special role in the financial system and may receive flight to safety flows, we include safe, we exclude safe havens. So we estimate the following panel model with country and time fixed effects. Let's walk through it briefly. But uh, first I wanna point out that the standard approach in the literature is something akin to this second stage here in equation three. Our contribution is the blue term. And then the second element of our contribution is the extraction of the shock, which is also in blue. So in short, what's new is in blue. We take each of the four macroprudential measures and regress them on a number of country variables associated with the implementation of macropro in the literature. So once we have fitted macropro in hand, we take the residual to be our shock and be tilde. And then the second stage is standard where our main, uh, very, our main term of interest is in blue right here the interaction between risk shocks and MP tilde, which gives us the effect of macro proof conditional on the risk realization. So uh, without further ado, let's take a look at the results because I think I have about four minutes left. First, we're gonna look at the results putting aside any relationship between risk and the macro prudential stance. So this is akin to what you would normally see in this literature. Uh, it's worth noting here at the beginning of the results section that all estimates that you see here today will include control variables. We just only show the variables of interest for ease of visual inspection so that we're not showing you a wall of numbers every time I switch the slides. So basically what we have here are our four measures of macro proof. In bold here first is the broad index, which is what I'm gonna focus on. The macro prudential stance is uh, up on top and then the risk on risk off shock is here on the bottom. So we can see that the risk off shock increases weekly outflows as a percent of assets under management on the order of nine to 10 basis points, which translates to about $2.3 billion a week. Macroprudential policy, on the other hand, this upper row doesn't register a statistically significant relationship with portfolio flows, and this agrees with prior literature. But when we interact the macroprudential stance with the risk shock, the picture changes substantially. So again, we have those four measures. I'm gonna be highlighting the broad index. Up top is row row, in the middle is the macroprudential stance. And on the bottom, this third set of, uh, this third set of numbers is what I'm gonna highlight, um, which shows the, uh, the difference in the effect of a row row shock between having a macroprudential stance at the mean versus mean plus one standard deviation. And so the negative sign that you see here suggests that comparatively tight macro pro amplifies the effect of risk shocks. However, it's important to mention that the magnitudes are not overwhelming. Using our preferred index, high macro pro countries experience about 20% higher bond outflows. However, this is from a one unit shock, which as I showed you in the time series is within the, within the interquartile range of the risk distribution. And as a reminder, the crisis moments that we've been thinking uh, hard about of late correspond to shocks of more than five standard deviations. So what we wanna know is what happens outside of the normal range of risk shocks. And so this brings us to our marginal analysis. So in the following section of the paper, we calculate the marginal impact of having ex ante higher, uh, tighter macroprudential policy conditional on the size and sign of the risk shock. And this is, uh, this is among our main contributions. So this table shows the results of taking the derivative of our estimating equation with respect to the ex ante macroprudential stance, and then evaluating that derivative at different points of the risk distribution. As a reminder, positive changes are risk off. So these top rows represent risk on events and lower rows represent risk off events. And the top and the bottom are the tails, the very top and the very bottom. So the salient patterns are as follows. Shocks in the outer 10% uh, re represent meaningfully, uh, economically meaningful outflows relative to the counterfactual of having less tight macroprudential macro stance. But when you compare extreme risk off to extreme risk on, the marginal impacts grow more quickly on the risk off side, almost double in the outer 1%. And this is a consequence of the skewed risk distribution and highlights the importance of considering the distribution of the underlying variables. So the potential for large, out, uh, for large outflows is greater than gener in general and macroprudential policies exacerbate these realizations. So we also, I'm very, very seriously running out of time. So I just wanna point out that we also take a granular approach to 
measuring the macroprudential stance, breaking down our preferred indices into, um, into the CCYB and the LTV and the FX measure, and then demand and supply. And we find that the main culprits behind our results are the LTV ratio, the uh, foreign exchange based uh, measures, and then uh, measures targeting the supply of credit. And the marginal effects bear out uh, similar patterns. There are some additional uh, results that we include in the paper that Mayor Brief mentioned. Basically, emerging market and advanced economies show no difference in the impact of the macroprudential stance conditional on the risk shock although risk shocks do hit EMs harder in this space. We also substitute various elements of the baseline and find little deviation from the results. These include uh, using the VIX as a risk measure, capital controls instead of macro proof, quarterly capital flow data, different currency denominations and quantile regressions, and we basically find the same uh, set of patterns as we find in the baseline. So to conclude, we find the impact of macroprudential regulations on portfolio flows is small during normal times with respect to the risk distribution, but much more substantive and significant in the extremes, especially in risk off periods. And so our paper unveils important interactions of macroprudential regulations with the global financial cycle, wherein macroprudential policies magnify the impact of risk shocks on bond flows. To be clear, the finding is not unqualified because the type of macro matters. And our results uh, also include a set uh, showing that macroprudential regulations shift intermediation to sectors that are more vulnerable to risk shocks, but it's also the case that they uh, dampen bank flows. So the costs need to be weighed against the benefits. And now I've abused my time for sure. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Carly. Uh, so now we're gonna have Eddie Yerba to discuss, to discuss these two interesting uh, papers. So Eddie, if you can do it like in 12, 14 minutes, it will be great. So then, then uh, Lucina and Carly can can uh, answer some questions, some of your questions, and also questions from the audience. Okay, so thanks a lot. Great. Uh, sorry, should be this slide. Um, thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me discussing this uh, in this session, which I think actually kind of capital, uh, international capital flows are an important source of financial stability or instability. And having these two papers uh, tackling this issue from similar, but also different angles is really, uh, really nice. So um, kind of the way I've tried to do this is gathering the two papers under the same umbrella, but of course also focusing on the particular differences that each one has. So. By discussing these papers, I'm also having a discussion on international micro effects or leakages on portfolio flows. Um, a strong disclaimer here, not Bank of England, PRA or anything related. These are only my own opinions and views. Um, and you'll see also kind of um, why that might matter because um, I'll try to draw some really uh, interesting implications from this. So starting with the first paper, uh, let me just, exactly. Starting with the first paper, um, the objective is really uh, to use that risk approach to estimate the entire probability distribution of future portfolio flows over different time horizons as a function of a number of factors that you see there, which is global financial conditions, domestic, domestic structural characteristics, policy frameworks, which are a bit more uh, time fixed, and currency policy responses. And findings and implications of this, stretching it a bit and kind of considering that you are all, well, most of you are in the US, so it's a lunchtime uh, period, is that there is really no free lunch in policy making. So what seems to be beneficial in the short run has downside risks further down the line or less effects or vice versa. And for instance, we see that more flexible exchange rate regimes in the very short run have or result in both large in and out flows after adverse global shock, but seem to support a larger rebound of flows uh, two years down the line or what the authors call medium run. And we find for better quality of institutions, the effects are really more in the medium run and foreign exchange interventions do seem to have effects in the very short run, but exacerbate the risk of large outflows of capital a bit further down the line. 
However, the kind of the authors then finally conclude that actually there might be a good a free lunch there in policymaking. In particular, microprudential policies seem to have sizable beneficial effects, both in what they call very short run and in the medium run. So actually, you can have both, and you can kind of uh, get the the best policy out there. For the second paper, um, I would summarize the following. So the objective is really to test if and how microprudential policies affect the sensitivity of portfolio flows at different stages of the global financial cycle. Um, and really, the findings or implications of the uh, of the humongous work that I've done is that the beauty of macropro lies in the details. So when designing an optimal macroprudential policy package, the precise tools need to be carefully considered. A bad choice of the specific tools may generate more leakages and financial stability costs and benefits. So really take care. So here I'm trying to kind of uh, give the two implications or examples that are uh, provided in the paper. So for instance, the tightening of policies that target efforts of exposures and bank supply of credit can significantly amplify the effects of risk shocks on portfolio flows. And in this particular sense in the equity flows. And furthermore, the, implication, the amplifications are more intense in risk off periods. However, on the other hand, the amplification is weaker for credit targeting instruments such as CCYB and for bond flows. So I mean, there is, um, you really kind of need to take care of what you're looking at. So kind of taking this together, one can envision scenarios where macroprudential regulation increases vulnerabilities of the domestic financial system to global financial swings if it pushes activity out of the regulatory perimeter. Now, this does not mean, and kind of, I, I think kind of the authors are very clear in the text that it, you know, we should re relax or remove macroprudential regulation, but rather that we need a nuancing and we need to take care in which way uh, the, the particular instruments are um, designed and what their aims are. So going back to the first paper, and uh, just a few highlights. It's a very well grounded and executed paper. It's mature paper. I can see that uh, kind of, um, I guess, kind of the uh, authors have gone through a few iterations and it's kind of in a solid state. A lot of attention has been put in the econometric details and interpretability of the results, including the limitations, which are really like, so you upfront, great. Nice positioning within the, or nesting within the broader literature. So you kind of really clear what you do and. Um, kind of how that contributes to the more general debate. And it establishes important facts, three effects of policies on gross capital inflows at different percentiles. These are now just some suggestions, maybe questions uh, for how to take this forward. So first of all, I would maybe think of expanding the universe of securities included in the portfolio. So at the moment you have bonds and equities, uh, having uh, other more non-standard assets and including derivatives, uh, uh, which are very prone to cross-border flows and also some exotics, I think would be really nice to see whether you kind of find even stronger effects maybe um, if you expand that universe. Potential extend what you call the medium run up to around five years because now the medium run is two years. I know this is econometrically challenging because it requires a lot of information, but potentially you can use insights from inflation expectations the long forecast literature and doing this a bit further down the line uh, prediction. The exchange rate risk, it wasn't really clear, maybe I missed this. Uh, so does the currency denomination of your portfolios across countries matter? Maybe you should split those that are denominated in USD versus other local currencies. Uh, so this differential uh, could impact some of the results. I don't think quant qualitatively, but maybe quantitatively. And I was wondering the statistical significance of 90% for some crucial variables seems that almost all percentiles are insignificant. Could this be because, of course, you're having such a heterogeneous group of countries there? So, could you maybe categorize them according to some exogenous characteristics so you don't mash with your, <laughs> with your coefficients? So for instance, degree of trade links or integration, geographical clusters, share of internal versus external investors, something like that. I would, it would be really nice if you dive deeper into some of the channels you find and you find indicative evidence and you discuss potential semi-symmetric effects, but it would be really good if you could go that uh, level further down. Now, I'm just wondering, you know, there's high disparity in frequency between policy actions and capital flows. 
which might be kind of some of the policy actions that are not really taken or the constant over time and so on. And that might be uh, uh, resulting in some weak identification. So um, kind of, could you take, don't know actually what the good suggestion here is, but um, you should at least kind of uh, potentially acknowledge that or show kind of how the actions have been taken across the countries that you have in your sample such that kind of the reader can really know that. And then control for cross-border spill was interventions in other countries. So what I call importing of uh, measures because all of these countries import also measures. And there is one set of measures in the bank sphere and then the non-bank financial uh, institution sphere. And here I show it's a complex matter. So this is actually a diagram from an ESRB or ECB group that I co-chaired a while back where we're looking at cross-border spill was a macro proof policy. And this shows you kind of how you can import that you as a country now being uh, country A, which is on the left, kind of how you import these uh, policies. And this could hopefully be helpful uh, for conceptualizing and kind of including that in your analysis. And the reference of that to that occasional paper, ECB occasional paper is here. To the other paper, um, very interesting studies on the forces uh, and the force that macroprudential stands exerts on capital flows, in particular in risk off periods versus what you call normal periods. Hopefully they remain normal. Um, really like that you use higher frequency identification um, for your flows and kind of you use weekly um, frequency there, which is absent in many macro per papers, which uses, uses more quarterly. You focus on aggregation of policy intensity. So you have policy intensity there and focus on macro national stance instead of you know, the dummy variables as nice as said in your presentation. So I'll go through again. Portf you link portfolio on cross-border capital flows marginal effects I really liked. You also went through that in detail. And here is implications to kind of, you provide important evidence, potentially even warnings against a uniform view of macroprudential policies. They don't, they're not all the same. And therefore, you know, we need to, the beauty is in the details, as I said. And you provide also serious warning against narrow exposed analysis of macroprudential regulation. And here, what I mean is, you know, we are often tempted in central banks or micro authorities, you know, to look at, uh, you know, what a particular measure has an impact on the target variable. And you say, oh, we've done the job, that's good, all fine. You're saying here, kind of, you should really, really uh, consider other uh, potential effects. And this might, of course, lead to some unobserved, unintended consequences, and they might have actually uh, serious impacts for the final uh, choice. And I think it's an important paper uh, that establishes empirical facts, especially in extreme events, but does not go that far in establishing clear causalities. Um, I understand that's also maybe um, where you want to stand. So suggestions. Um, the paper is currently like a rough diamond, as I call it. So it would definitely benefit from a rewrite, removal of repetitions, which I've found, and a better focus. I guess it's a still work in progress, so perfectly fine. Um, but it will help the reader, definitely. Um, you also speak about the impact of tighter regulation risk-off periods, but we know that you know, in those risk-off periods, there's a strong pressure to loosen the buffers of regulation during this period. So how do you reconcile the two? Or how do you allow for that endogeneity of uh, pressures to loosen the macro brew and then the final effect that you uh, measure? The next few comments. Um, the next one is about this migration of activity, and that wasn't very clear. It could be also um, my limitation of the reading. I haven't had that much time. Is that you commit some argue about the migration of activity and hence vulnerabilities to outside of the regulatory perimeter. Um, but I get a feeling that this is all kind of bank versus non-bank based. So kind of would this mechanism disappear if it's a manly, mainly bank based system, first of all? Equally, we know that banks engage in a lot of equity bond and other activities. So I'm just wondering, are you here assuming that kind of banks here have a relatively low role, low role in this market? So which, which way does it affect? So here, what I'm meaning, I'm actually, I'm sorry for self-marketing myself, but um, I have a paper here with a colleague, which is gonna be forthcoming, where we impact, where we examine the impact of Basel III regulation on repo markets and banks 
or have an important role there in intermediation. And what we see during the COVID period, just to throw out a few results, is that indeed intermediation activities migrated out of uh, the bank sphere, so into hedge funds actually, or investment funds. But still banks have an important role. So I mean, although there is a migration of activity, uh, it doesn't mean that you know, kind of banks do not have any stake at this. The leakages and spillovers to portfolios. Can you say something about the um, reasons for that? So did regulatory arbitrage or other non-prudential specific factors, such as I mean, during this period, we also have unconventional monetary policy and search for yield. So this could also be driving. Um, you include data from 1990. Uh, this kind of puts us into two very different regimes in terms of thinking on prudential regulation. The earlier regime, uh, which is, let's say, before the great financial crisis and the post, so maybe um, kind of having that separation. And then I'll just uh, throw the last one. So how do you separate between FX intervention regulation and conventional monetary policy, which in itself has an effect on FX activity and holdings? And yeah, I'm happy to kind of reach out, feel free, and we can have a discussion later if anything is not clear, but thanks. Hey, thank you, Eddie. So there is a there is a question from the from from the audience. Uh, so this is this is a general question for the authors for LPV implicitly and CCLB explicitly our contracyclical. How do we think about that when you say tighter or looser macroprudential policy? I, I think you can also see the, the question in the in the chat. Uh, I don't know if if uh, any of you wants to answer this question, and also if you want to 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 answer to Eddie some of his feedback, uh, you can take like a couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm happy to yeah to, to, to go, go first. Uh, uh, so maybe first on the the comments by Eddie. Thank you very much, and I think you did a great job in like combining the comments for for two papers. And I really enjoyed also Carla's paper. I think we can take a lot of uh, things that they have done uh, uh, in the paper regarding the way of thinking about macroprudential policies uh, and. Uh, enhance uh, uh, our paper actually so that was super interesting thank you very much for all the suggestions uh, in fact regarding expanding the results to longer horizons that's something that we are now working on uh, we're also uh, trying to uh, conduct the, the regressions as you mentioned as uh, maybe separately for different groups of countries so exclude some outliers or uh, or, or really see whether this, uh, there are differences between different, different groups. Uh, we tried uh, including spillovers in a kind of a rough way by, by looking at controlling for a region uh, uh, of the country and you know, having some, some dummies indicating whether there was large outflow or inflow in another country in the region uh, in the previous period, but this did not really uh, change our results. But perhaps we, we should mention that more explicitly uh, uh, in the paper. Uh, and on other suggestions, so like points well taken and uh, definitely will help us to improve, uh, improve the write-up, uh, especially on the links to the, to the theoretical literature. So thank you very much. Uh, and on the LTV and CCYB, um, I know if I understand the question correctly, but I think, yeah, higher CCYB or lower LTV limits is, uh, is equivalent to a tightening of policy and uh, higher LTV limits and lower capital uh, buffers. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's tightening. Yes, I, I think I got it right. <laughs> Thank you. I think there was a, a a lot more on my on my end to answer, so I think I'll um, I'll take a, a moment to digest the comments and and think about them a little more. But I but some of the some of this is feedback that we've heard before in in this summer of conferences, and so um, 
you're certainly you're certainly not alone in some of your feedback. Uh, and um, I think that the I think one one distinction that that we need to narrow down in the writing, uh, and this also comes up in the questions that came up in in the in the Q and A, um, is that because of the frequency of the data, we can answer what the distribution of outcomes looks like conditional on the ex ante stance. So a country builds up fundamentals, a shock hits, and we observe the effect of the shock based on those policy fundamentals. Um, because the frequency of the macro credential data is uh, much slower, it's very hard to establish a causal link for what countries do in the face of a shock. So I, I do agree that um, I do agree that there is pressure to loosen uh, macro prudential regulations in the face of a shock, but unfortunately, the data is uh, unkind to us in, in this respect. So it's just a, it's a question of uh, comparing the fates of countries that have certain configurations of uh, of policies in place, um, which also uh, I think answers in part one of the q a questions and then there was another q a question about the COVID crisis not being a global financial cycle event while i agree that the provenance of COVID is uh, epidemiological and not financial there was a severe liquidity crunch in its wake uh, and so that reverberates throughout the financial system and and that actually has large consequences in the um in the fund flow data that we use because liquidity in underlying bond markets is uh, sparse compared to equities. So it actually ends up having pretty big financial consequences in, in the space that we're analyzing. Um, Eddie, I want to give you I want to give you a chance to 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 highlight one that you really want to have answered now, since I think it's time to move on. But and there was a lot to answer. <laughs> So otherwise, I'll just um, I'll reach out to to Eddie offline, and then we'll we'll consider the comments separately. Thank you so much for your thoughtful feedback. Thanks a lot, uh, Lucina, Carly, and Eddie for such an interesting discussion. Uh, now we're gonna have a uh, Caterina Bergant from uh, from IMF presenting a, her paper, "Dumping Global Financial Shocks." Can macroprudential regulation help more than capital controls? Uh, so please, Carly. Uh, no, so, sorry. Please, uh, Katarina, you have uh, 18 minutes. I will let you know when you have five and two minutes warning. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Could you just let me know if you see the full screen? Yes, perfect. Uh, okay. No, 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 not, not, not now. It's not full screen. It's not full screen? No. Let me try to, it worked before. Okay. Tried it before. Um, let me try this. There you go. Now you can see the full screen? Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me in this session. This is really on point and it's always great to present in such a session where topics are kind of put together so we can focus on the same uh, research question, don't need to repeat the broader context. So I'm very happy um, to talk today about dampening global financial shocks in emerging markets and uh, in this presentation, we will specifically focus on macroprudential tools. And this is joint work uh, with Francesco Grigoli, Nils Jakob Hansen, and Damiano Sandri. And obviously, these are our views and uh, not the IMF. So let me start right away um, with our research question. I mean, I don't need to say much of this. Um, but we know there is a big literature out there now that global financial shocks can severely affect emerging markets. Um, and we also know that according to theory, um, no news to this group, exchange rate flexibility in theory should be sufficient to dampen these global shocks for emerging markets. However, this is not often the case and we see that emerging markets economies and their outputs suffer when there are global negative um, shocks. 
Therefore, the international community, policymakers, the IMF, many more central banks have been looking at other tools um, that we could use to dampen uh, those global shocks. So in this paper, we will specifically look at macroprudential measures. And in contrast to the papers that you just saw, we will actually look at can macroprudential measures buffer the effects on global financial shocks on GDP growth. So in contrast to looking at capital flows, as the other two uh, papers did, we're going to look at GDP growth overall. Um, and similar to the paper you just heard, um, the last paper, we're also going to look at how the level of macroprudential policy um, can buffer the effect of a global financial shock on an emerging market. Then, as a second question, we will look at whether macroprudential uh, policies can enhance monetary independence. So we see often that emerging markets are pro-cyclical um, with global financial shocks. When the U.S. hikes, uh, emerging markets also hike, hike, although their financial conditions tighten in that sense. And we see a high level of macroprudential policy can enhance monetary independence, so they could adjust their policy rate more to their uh, domestic conditions. The last question we want to add is, uh, can monetary policy entail other side effects? And we will focus there on cross-country spillover on other AMs, but also on the effect on average growth. So let me start uh, right by showing you some data that we will use for, uh, for our empirical strategy. So on the top left, you can see the first two shocks that we will use. So in red, you see the VIX, which will be our shock to the risk premium, and the blue line, which is the US policy rate adjusted for, um, this, for un unconventional monetary policy. And it's, that's why you can see it going below the zero lower bound. So those are two of our shocks. The third shock is in the top right graph which are net capital inflows to emerging markets. I plotted here the mean and the interquartile range. And this will be our shock to the supply of foreign capital. On the bottom left, you can see real GDP growth in emerging markets. And you can already see that this real GDP growth in emerging markets co-moves with the global financial shock. So we can already see that the literature out there uh, grasps this correlation. And the last graph, the bottom right, shows the level of macroprudential regulation. So um, as, as the last paper that, uh, that was just presented, we completely agree with the argument that what you should look at once a shock hits is the level of macroprudential regulation that is at place at that point in time. And how do we get there? Um, we take a slightly different, potentially a simpler approach than the paper you just heard. We look at the same data set, the IMAP data set by the IMF. And the IMAP data set actually contains 17 different measures. And for each measure, we have a one if they tighten and a minus one if they loosen. And basically, we add up all these ones and minus ones of each measure. And then um, we get a cumulative measure that is our tightness, our stance of macroprudential regulation. So again, what we're looking at, we're not looking at how um, does GDP change when macroprudential regulation change. There we, we see an obvious endogeneity problem. Um, however, we look at um, how does GDP change when a global financial shock hits, given that there's a certain level of macroprudential regulation in place. So going now to our first question, can the level of macroprudential regulation buffer the effects of global financial shocks on GDP growth? So to address this question um, in a formal regression setting, um, we estimate the panel regression of real GDP growth on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, um, we have a various uh, number of variables, featuring interaction effects, quadratic terms, and so on. Let me start um, by saying that uh, the vector we'll be looking at, the global financial shocks, is on the right-hand side, is the vector S, which will include the shock to the U.S. rates. These are shocks to the, to the change in the rate following Yacobello and Navarro, 
Then we have the shock in the risk premium, which is the VIX. And then we have shocks to the supply of foreign capital, which are net capital outflows, but they are instrumented by net capital outflows from all the other countries around. Um, and then we also, we have these shocks now in the S vector, but what we're really interested in, as I just said, is the effect of these shocks S given a certain level of macroprudential regulation in place. So this is why what you really want to look at is gamma, which is the coefficient on the interaction of macroprudential regulation and the shock. Um, we also include this um, quadratic following the literature, and we also include um, a vector of controls. We control for lack GDP growth, institutional quality, commodity terms of trade, and so on. Our sample includes 38 uh, emerging markets with quarterly data from 2000 to 2016. This uh, closely mimics, it is modified, but mimics a framework uh, first mentioned in Opsted and co-authors 2019. So let me jump right uh, through the results uh, by showing you some pictures. So here we report the der derivative of real GDP growth with respect to the shocks. So what you can see is the effect on GDP, uh, depending on which level of macroprudential regulation you have in place. So let me start, uh, maybe, maybe it's good to illustrate an example. Look at the graph two, which is the top right graph, which is the response to a 10% VIX increase. So if you look at this graph on the very left side, you can see that at very low levels of macroprudential regulation, a 10% increase in the VIX has a significant negative effect on GDP growth. However, as you move further to the right, to countries with a higher macroprudential stance, you can see that the effect of the VIX on domestic GDP growth becomes insignificant. And the same goes um, for net capital outflows. You see at the bottom left, you can see at very low levels um, of macroprudential regulation, a 1% change in net outflows has significant negative effects on growth. But as you move to the right, these effects become insignificant. And the bottom right graph is just to show you uh, the distribution of macroprudential regulations. So these numbers that I'm telling you, uh, let's look at the um, top right graph, number two, you see that the effect of the VIX on GDP growth becomes insignificant at around 20. You can see that 20 is a number that is actually very frequent in our data. It is on the higher edge, so countries still have room to improve and to introduce more macroprudential regulation to buffer these shocks. However, it's not a crazy number that, that is not even uh, in our country. We also, in the interest of time, I'm gonna have to skip this uh, or, or be very brief on this, but we also did do a lot of robustness checks and you could be, you could be very concerned about reverse causality. So um, did GDP change, uh, did, did macroprudential change in response to GDP? However, again, I want to stress that we're not looking at the change of GDP, we're looking at the level. This level is extremely sticky and is an accumulation over the last 16 years. So we're naturally less concerned about energy. However, we also lag this level and, and our, our results are robust. You could also be concerned about the omitted variable bias, but we do here on the right hand side of the of the slide, you see we do a lot of uh, robustness tests with a lot of additional control variables and our results remain robust. So now another thing you could be worried about is that this whole effect is driven by specific macroprudential regulation. So whatever you might be working on, you think of LTVs or foreign exchange regulation or of capital, counter-cyclic capital buffers. We, do, we are aware that there's a very wide range um, of macroprudential regulation in, in this data set. So we split them into groups. Um, we have uh, macroprudential regulation targeting capital, targeting credit demand or credit supply, targeting foreign currency exposure and targeting liquidity. So um, we do this estimation again, using only the macroprudential stance of these particular tools. And you can see that actually um, the buffering effect of the tools is significant for a wide range of tools. And um, it's not just for a specific 
uh, range, for example, the dampening effect regarding the VIX, significant for measures targeting credit demand, foreign currency exposure and liquidity, and um, for the shocks against net outflows, measures targeting capital credit demand and credit supply are significant. So this, this really hints that it's not just one measure um, that, that targets these buffering properties and that as also maybe potentially a wide range of measures is desirable for the policymaker. Another worry you might have, especially if you are advising countries, is, is this a fact metric? So um, often I, I'm talking about a negative shock and oh, thank God we have macroprudential regulation and it buffers the shock. Um, but what you also could consider, is it also in good times, if we're hit by a good shock, um, might it also slow down the growth we would otherwise experience? So we, um, we split our sample into periods where there's uh, positive and neg negative um, GDP growth and we see uh, <laughs> positive and negative global financial shocks, I'm sorry. And we see that, yes, the, the effect is symmetric, pack prudential regulation dampen the effects of both, of positive and negative global financial shocks. We also looked at other tools. I have to be very quick at this, but our main finding remains robust also um, regards shock on domestic credit exchange rate. So macroprudential regulation, the level of macroprudential regulation can also dampen the effect of global financial shocks on domestic credit and the exchange rate. Moving on to our second major um, question, um, which is whether macroprudential can also help countries enhance their monetary independence from the global financial cycle. So to make, to make this question, um, let me start by uh, reminding you of the policy trilemma in international macro. I mean, you probably don't need this, but according to this trilemma, countries with open capital accounts and a flexible exchange rate sh should retain monetary independence. However, there is, uh, there is evidence that countries do tighten and they are pro-cyclical with monetary policy with respect to the global financial um, stock, possibly to stabilize the exchange rate or their financial flow. So specifically, there are studies out there that have found that EMs tend to hike policy rates when global financial conditions tighten, um, which works to make their monetary response, as I said, pro-cyclical. So in this, uh, in this exercise, we will investigate if a higher level of macroprudential regulation can allow emerging markets to conduct a more counter-cyclical monetary policy in response to global financial shocks. And the idea by, behind this hypothesis is that by creating kind of a more resilient financial system, macroprudential policies can allow monetary, monetary policy to focus squarely on inflation and output thus becoming more counter-cyclical. So here we use a similar regression framework. We regress the domestic policy rates in emerging markets on a set of global financial shocks. Again, the shocks are in the vector S. Um, and the shocks include, again, the US policy rates, the VIX and net capital outflows instrumented. And again, we interact this shock with the macro uh, prudential measure um, that is at place in, in time t. So here you see the results, we plotted them again. And again, you see the estimated response, in the domestic policy rate to the global shock as a function of the level of macro prudential measures. So according to the equation I showed you before, the estimated monetary policy response to a shock will be beta. Uh, plus gamma times the macro credential level. In chart one, um, you see the estimated policy response to an increase in the US rate as a function of the macro prudential uh, level. So again, you can see for a very low or, or low moderate levels up to around 20 of macro prudential measures, you see that countries actually tend to increase their own policy rate in a response to the increase in the US policy rate. However, this estimate, um, it becomes increasingly smaller as the level of macroprudential measures increases and becomes insignificant um, starting at around the level of 20. In, in chart number two, you see a very similar picture for an increase in the VIX. You can see again at very low levels um, of macroprudential regulation an increase in the VIX, 
lets emerging markets tighten their domestic exchange rate, which is against our intuition if they're under financial stress. But as you move along these macroprudential regulations, starting at around 50, 20, you can see that this is significant or even negative. So uh, countries with a very high level of macroprudential regulations are able to loosen their monetary policy um, if when, when we have a shock to the risk premium. There is no significant effect of net outflows, which um, was surprising to us, um, but you can clearly see it in the, in the US rate hike um, and the shock to the risk. Again, we did the usual uh, robustness test, which I will skip now because I really want to, I have two minutes left um, and I really want to answer the last question, which are, are there side effects of macroprudential regulation? We focus here on average growth and cross-country spillovers. So let me start with average growth. Um, you, I, I just mentioned to you that the effect was symmetric. So these macroprudential regulation, they buffer negative global financial shocks. However, they also dampen positive global financial shocks. So um, the policymaker is more concerned about their average growth. What does it do in the medium to long term? So what we did in this exercise, we really looked at a typical country at the 75 percentile of macroprudential regulation versus a country at the 25th percentile, and we compared them. Um, in, the first, in the first graph you see here, the bottom left, you can see that Yes, in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, actually the country with the higher macroprudential regulation uh, signi experienced significantly lower growth. So the blue line is the difference in, in growth of um, the point estimate between the high and the low macroprudential regulation country. But on the other hand, when the shock hit the global financial crisis, the country with the high macroprudential regulation experienced significantly higher growth. So now you, you want to know probably how this evens out, but let me first show you in graph two that the volatility for the country that had higher regulation is significantly lower. And in the third graph, we showed that the effect on average GDP growth, so looking at this medium term, it was insignificant. So we would argue you do want to be the country with the high macroprudential regulation because it does not affect your average growth. It does not lower your average growth. However, you get significantly lower volatility. And the last finding, um, because we just talk, talked about cross-country spillovers, um, is that we investigate um, how uh, a country introducing, the countries around you introducing macroprudential regulation can affect your own um, economy. I mean, there is this hypothesis out there if all the other countries around you shield themselves off uh, from very bad capital flows or, or other risky flows, they could all go to you. So what we do in this regression, we include the level of macroprudential regulation in the countries around you. We have here same geographical region, same income class and same risk class. However, we see that this, um, that this coefficient is either insignificant or positive. So countries around you having good macroprudential regulation can, if anything, affect you only positively. And our theory behind this is that you can you, ha you have more likely strong trade and financial flows um, with countries that have um, stronger macroprudential regulation. And I'm not because I ran out of time, I think, Augustine, right? So I am I'm gonna leave the conclusion slide up there and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thanks a lot, Katarina. There are some, uh, there is, I think, one question and some comments in the Q&A, so if you want to check it out. And, and after my discussion, you're gonna have some, some minutes to address these questions, okay? So now we're gonna have a Christian Frederick from the Bank of Canada talking about monetary policy independence and the strength of the global financial cycle. So please, Christian, go ahead. Thank you. Can you see the slide? Yes. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in this session. And as Katerina mentioned before, the papers all fit very nicely together and hopefully this one too. <laughs> so I'll talk about monetary policy independence and the strength of the global financial cycle. That's joint work with Pierre Gorin from the IMF and Danilo Leva Leon from the Bank of Spain. So these are obviously our, our own views. 
So before I start with the um, presentation, I, I want to go over uh, some of the, the terminology that's really important to, to distinguish different concepts uh, in this paper. So the first one is when I talk about the global financial cycle and its dynamics. So I guess everyone knows this, but uh, just to be clear again. So this we define as the global co-movement and capital flows or asset prices uh, that occur at the higher frequency, uh, for example, as, as the frequency of, of the WICs or US monetary policy as, as shown by Helen Ray's work and, and many others afterwards. But the key here is when we talk about the dynamics, it's basically the alternation of boom phases and contraction phases of the cycle. So it, to give you a kind of a real life example, so if you think of a choir that sings a song and this song would have like series of, of high pitched notes and low pitched notes. So that's kind of the global financial cycle and the dynamics. So the second important concept for this uh, presentation is the country's time varying sensitivity to the global financial cycle. So that's the relationship between a country and the global financial cycle. This may involve some kind of causality from the global financial cycle to the country, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case because it's a two way relationship. So coming back to the choir example, this would be the equivalent of each member of the choir singing, sometimes a bit softer, sometimes a bit louder, and listening to the song at the same time. And then the third concept of interest uh, to understand this paper is the strength of the global financial cycle. So this is then the aggregate impact of the country's sensitivities to the global financial cycle. And going back to the choir example, this would be if the choir sings louder on aggregate, the volume of the music uh, would be louder. So. First important concept is the global financial cycle, it's dynamics. The second important concept is the time varying sensitivity or the strength of the global financial cycle. So let me motivate uh, why we really distinguish between these concepts and why it's important to look at the, the strength of the global financial cycle. So the global financial crisis gave rise to literature, especially with a focus on the dynamics of the global financial cycle, then its implication for small open economies, and as, as previous uh, speaker mentioned, the degree of, of monetary policy independence. However, overall, there has been much less attention paid to countries' time varying sensitivities or the strength of the global financial cycle. But there are a number of trends or recent developments that actually show that this is an important concept. So one uh, important aspect here is there have been uh, a number of papers have documented uh, changes in the relationship between WICs and US monetary policy on the, uh, on the one hand and international capital flows on the other hand uh, over the global financial crisis. And, and afterwards, yeah, there's plenty of evidence that some of the relationships have changed. Maybe the other side of the same coin is financial regulation has been introduced and that may have led to changes between uh, the domestic financial conditions and, and international capital flows as well. So again, there's some kind of structural change here. And then third, from, from a theoretical perspective, there's uh, more recently more and more work on financial frictions. And, and this work shows that financial shocks, so it's basically a shock to an agent's borrowing constraint. They can amplify, these shocks can amplify or mitigate the country's sensitivity to the global financial cycle. And this happens independently of the face of the global financial cycle, so independently of prices or quantities of the global financial cycle. So overall, uh, this suggests that the, the concept of, of global financial cycle strength is, is a very important one. And, and that's why we look at this in, in our paper. In terms of the empirical literature, there's basically two approaches that people develop to, to identify a global financial cycle. So on the one hand, you could proxy the global financial cycle with the single variable. Think of the VIX, US monetary policy or measure of global liquidity. And then you can interact this with the country specific proxy for, uh, let's say, ex foreign exchange rate exposures or, or any other kind of country specific variables. And then you can test relatively complex hypotheses in a relatively straightforward way. Like one of the downside of, of these approaches, as I mentioned on the previous slide, more recently, there are more and more evidence of these kind of changes in the structures between, let's say, the VIX and, and capital flows, which would then, going forward, make it harder to, to kind of find a stable relation uh, between the two, because if the relation changes, then there may be other things going on that, that we may not be able to fully uh, understand. So the second approach is then more from a time series uh, perspective, where the global financial cycle is extracted with an often dynamic uh, factor model. So the advantage of this approach is you can uh, extract the latent factor from a set of variables, and you would probably get the more uh, robust global financial cycle because it's just based on a richer set of, of variables. And if one changes, it probably doesn't matter as, as much. However, in, in the traditional uh, empirical literature, these factor loadings 
the, the variables that capture the, the country's sensitivity to the global financial cycle, they're usually assumed to be constant. And this is exactly where our uh, paper makes uh, the main contribution. So what we do is we propose a new strength measure of the global financial cycle by estimating a regime switching factor model on cross-border equity flows for 61 countries in weekly data. And we find that the strength of the global financial cycle varies substantially over time, and it does so heterogeneously across countries. And I'll talk about this a little bit later. When I talk about the global financial cycle, in this paper, we identify it at a high frequency. And we use equity uh, flows, uh, also from the EPFR data set, to, to identify it. We think it's, it's a fairly similar concept to the standard global financial cycle, but it's more focused on high frequency and equity flows. And there are some periods where they slightly uh, differ from like standard concept of like Helen Ray global financial cycle, but overall we think it's, it's a very comparable concept. In the second part of the paper, we then use a local projection approach in connection with country sensitivities to the global financial cycle to assess the degree of monetary policy independence. And we find that while central banks tighten policy rates in response to an unexpected increase in inflation during times of low global financial cycle strength, their response becomes more muted or doesn't even seem to follow a Taylor rule during times of high global financial cycle strength. And then in the third part, and this kind of relates to, uh, yeah, basically all the other papers in this session as well, we assess the impact of three different policy tools regarding the ability to increase monetary policy independence. And we find that capital controls, macroprudential policies, and a more flexible exchange rate regime can help mitigate the impact of the global financial cycle. So let me start with the first uh, part of the paper. It's, it's looking at the strength of the global financial cycle. So in terms of the data, as I mentioned, we use the EPFR data uh, as well to, to extract the global financial cycle in, in high frequency. Uh, we use here the, the equity fund flows in uh, 61 economies at weekly frequency over a period from 2001 to 2019. And this results in, in, in a more high frequency global financial cycle than maybe some of you may be used to. There's also uh, rich evidence, as it was previously mentioned in the, uh, previously mentioned in the second paper, that the, between the EPFR data and the ba uh, balance of payments data, they're relatively highly correlated and they seem to, to to capture the same dynamics. Since we have weekly data here, and it's a bit hard to, to relate it uh, to GDP over, which is yeah mostly measured at the quarterly or annual level. So what we do here is we uh, use the EPFR data and express the flows as percentage change in outstanding investments at the start of each week. Uh, so it's mostly like a cross rate based uh, approach instead of uh, in percent of GDP. And then we could think about why do equity flows still makes sense if a lot of the, the global financial cycle literature is defined in bond flows or credit flows. So first of all, the simple answer is it's a, one of the good uh, measures available at high frequency and we can have it over an extended period of time. So this allows us to, to use more uh, sophisticated econometrics methods on it. That's the simple answer. But there's uh, also more to it. So even the original work of Helen Ray talks about the global financial cycle as co-movement in risky assets and obviously equity flows are uh, a risky asset. There's also, if that's still not convincing, we showed, or we can see in even uh, Helen Ray's work that there's a relatively high correlation between equity flows and bond flows. If you, if you look at Europe, for example, that correlation is, is uh, 0.5. Uh, so it's, it's relatively high between uh, uh, equity flows and other types of flows. So it seems to be still a reasonably uh, good proxy for, for bonds and credit flows. In terms of the methodology, what we do is we estimate the dynamic factor model uh, and simultaneously estimate a common factor, which represents the global financial cycle, and it's time varying loadings. That's the strength of the global financial cycle. And you can see in the equation here that uh, equity flows into country I at time T, it's the YIT on the left, is explained by the common factor. And the key here is the gamma I SIT, it's the time varying loading uh, for country I at time T, which represents our strength or uh, sensitivity of a country to the global financial cycle. And here we follow, uh, um, we allow the factor loadings to evolve according to idiosyncratic Markovian dynamics, which is some work that my co did uh, with uh, a third cohort. And the key here is that we have this uh, SIT, it's basically a latent state variable, and that's driven by, uh, that has two, two regimes and the switching between those uh, regimes is driven by a first order Markov chain with constant transition probabilities. And there's a low cool movement regime and there's a high cool movement regime. There's also an idiosyncratic term of, of the um, 
of the overall uh, equation that that we uh, or the variance of that we allow to to differ across the two regimes as well and finally we estimated uh, with the bayesian method that's also some work that my co-authors did so what comes out here so let me first uh, even though it's not the, the core focus of our paper but obviously that the comes out the, the common factor and we see this on the top left so as i mentioned before uh, that's basically our, our measure of the global financial cycle uh, as I mentioned before, it's based on high frequency data, so it makes it look uh, more volatile. So the blue uh, uh, lines that go up and down uh, are the global financial cycle here. If we smooth it a little bit, which is the dashed uh, um, black line in the background, we see that between 2002 and 2006, there's an increase in, in the uh, kind of in the boom phase of the global financial cycle. Then comes the crisis, the, the cycle. Uh, uh, weakens, then there's kind of the rebound, especially in equity flows after after um, the global financial crisis, then comes the European debt crisis, and, and then it kind of tapers out a little bit. So overall, we're pretty similar to, to the dynamics of, of the global financial cycle in, in the literature. And then at the bottom right, we actually compared one-to-one -to, -one to, to the uh, cycle in, in Helen Ray's work, at least for the period where we overlap. We see it's not a perfect match, especially around the global financial crisis. We, we see some uh, deviations, but it's a relatively good fit between 2001 and 2006. And then after the global financial crisis, we get pretty much the same uh, dynamics as well. Part of the explanation for why it's a bit different between 2006 and 2008 is our uh, global financial cycle measure is, is much uh, based on basically one type of, of equity flows. But the, the Helen Ray global financial cycle is a much broader measure and includes more asset prices. And there happened to be, uh, like for example, in 2006 and 2007, even before the global financial crisis started, uh, some major uh, uh, corrections in equity markets for some EMEs. So now comes kind of the, the core output of our paper. It's the strength measure of the global financial cycle. So this is basically the loadings, the share of sample countries in a high co movement regime at each point in time. And the solid line here is the median and the shaded areas around is some kind of credible sets at the fifth and 90th percentile of the distribution. And what we can see from this measure here is that the strength measure is highly time bearing and it's not constant as one would expect from previous approaches in the literature, it's, it's highly time bearing. And you can see in uh, 2007, it reaches a point of almost one. And uh, in, in 2011, the, the share is almost uh, zero. So it's really this sensitivity to the global financial cycle, the strength measure is, is really time bearing. And to give you a bit of a better idea of, of what this uh, line here represents, we can slice it up at any point in time vertically. And I do this uh, for one specific week. So this is the week with the most heterogeneous co-movement across countries. That's in late 2008 uh, after Lehman. Uh, that, that's basically very negative growth expectations. Uh, US cut the, 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 or the Fed cut the rates. And you got this kind of flight to safety patterns. You see a lot of the emerging markets show a very red uh, color scheme. So capital flows out of, of the uh, emerging markets. A lot of it goes to safe haven countries at the advanced economies, but this is a more uh, like it's often the US, it's, it's maybe some others, but it's not like a as common uh, flow to all of the advanced economies. So that's why they score more in, in, the, in the yellow uh, shade. But if you go to like exactly the Lehman week, for example, everything is red. If you go to other weeks, uh, things, things might look different, but just to show that even though there is the strength measure, everything moves together, but it's still heterogeneously across countries. So this concludes the, the first part of the paper. Uh, next, we then look at the implications for monetary policy independence. And again, this builds, uh, I guess everyone knows here on, on the previous work of Helen Ray and uh, as Katarina mentioned, uh, the, the trilemma. Um, what we do here is we examine the policy rate response of a central bank to an unexpected change in inflation during times of local movement and during times of high co movement. And we construct here a relatively exogenous change in inflation. We call this an inflation gap shock. So that's basically re residual from an unobserved component model with a trend and a cyclical component. And we take the residual, which is kind of an unexpected uh, movement in inflation. And then we conduct this analysis separately for two, two panels. So one is of nine emerging markets and seven advanced economies. And we do this at monthly frequency from 2002 to 2017. In terms of the methodology and the, the data we're using here, so we use a local projection approach, a la Jorda, but with the regime dependence added as in Remy and Subari. 
Uh, that's basically on the left hand side you have the policy uh, rate of the uh, the central bank of country i at time t and we use the uh, shadow rate if, if that rate is at the zero lower bound we have country fixed effects so one for each regime and time fixed effects we have a vector of controls like policy rate output gap nominal effective exchange rate we can also include uh, industry production or commodity price index and the results don't really change there's this inflation gap shock this exogenous movement in inflation that i mentioned before and then this ij it minus one is a dummy variable that takes on the value of one if we're in a high co-movement regime and zero otherwise and we determine what, in which regime we are basically on the, the Bayesian estimation output from, from the dynamic factor model. And then we can also plot uh, confidence bands uh, around. So this is basically the outcome of this exercise. We show here the policy response to a positive inflation shock for the emergent market sample. And these are impulse response function of the policy rate after a positive uh, inflation gap shock. And as expected, if you look at the blue line during uh, times of low uh, co-movement, we see that the central banks tightens the policy rate in response to positive uh, surprise in inflation. That's what we would expect from the Taylor rule. However, during high co movement uh, times or in, in the high co movement regime, here highlighted in, in red, we see that we see a different pattern. So, not, not the tightening in response to, to a positive surprise in inflation. So, this shows that during, uh, during the high co movement regime, central banks do something else and they don't follow uh, the Taylor rule. We also find a relatively similar pattern for advanced economies, although it's a bit shifted down uh, because inflation rates are generally lower. There. Now, let me spend the last minute on talking about possible policy options. So I showed you in, in the last uh, section that there's a present of the high co-movement regime makes or appears that that reduces uh, monetary policy independence. In the first part, I showed you that there's the factor model and we have identified these time varying probabilities for being in a high uh, co-movement regime. Now in the third part, what we do here is we take these time varying uh, probabilities, use it on the left hand side and look at how different uh, policies to mitigate uh, these kind of probabilities and therefore increase, uh, looking at how these policies can e eventually increase the, the monetary policy independence by decreasing these uh, probabilities. So the policies we look at is capital controls, macroprudential policies, and flexible exchange rate, and they're basically from the same sources as everyone here in the session. Um, so we show that all these three policies, uh, or all these three policy options, can basically help restore monetary policy independence by reducing these these probabilities of being in the high co-movement regime. And here's just an example of of how we do this analysis. So on the top. Uh, the dependent variable are this uh, probability of, of being in a high co-movement regime. Then we have on the left uh, the uh, variables of capital controls. Uh, here you use the counter-cyclic capital buffer as a measure of macroprudential policy and then uh, dummy for being in a flexible exchange rate regime. And we can see no matter kind of how we include the variables and which combinations we include them, all of them carry basically a negative sign. So a tightening in capital controls, tightening in macroprudential policies or moving to a more flexible exchange rate regime reduces these uh, probabilities of being in a high co-movement regime and therefore would uh, suggest that there's an increase in monetary policy independence. Finally, to conclude, so we develop a measure of a global financial cycle strength and show that this measure varies heterogeneously across countries. We then show that the central banks, emerging markets and advanced economies respond to unexpected inflation shocks in line with the Taylor rule when there is times of low co-movement, but they appear to respond differently in times of high co-movement. And then finally, we show that there's several policy options, in particular capital controls, macroprudential policies, and a flexi flexible exchange rate regime that may ha help uh, to restore this, this monetary policy independence. And then uh, kind of connected to the topic of the conference, so there is kind of some good news of, uh, for central banks in it. So first of all, monetary policy independence doesn't seem to be a problem during normal times. And second of all, exchange rate flexibility can still help to mitigate the impact of, of these external shocks. And with this, uh, I conclude. Thanks a lot, Christian. So now what, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna discuss uh, the paper by Katerina and, and the paper by Christian. And then I think I'm gonna do like five minutes for each of them. So you can also answer some of the questions from the, from the, um, from the audience and then we can finish on time, okay? So 
I, I, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to start with the paper by Katarina. So I have to, can you all see? Perfect. So I have to, to say that I feel very grateful to be in the session because even though I, I, I am not an applied macroeconomist, I think I learned a lot about this. Uh, so, so I really enjoy this, this paper. Uh, as a summary, I will say that what I understood that is the main question uh, is that how effective is macroprudential regulation to reduce the impact of global financial shocks, which is basically something that we, all, all, all of you in some sense have been addressing. Uh, so what, she, what, they, what they do is they study the effects of macroprudential regulation uh, against global financial shocks using data only for emerging economies. Uh, this is something that will be slightly different from the paper by Christian. Uh, who has a, a sample for advanced and emerging economies as well. Uh, and the main finding I will say is that they show that a tighter level of regulation reduces sensitivity, sensitivity of GDP growth to risk premium and capital shocks. Uh, on top of that, uh, there is no evidence that capital controls provide similar benefits which is very interesting. And actually one of the questions from the, from the audience is about this. So, so I will let uh, Katerina address this later. Uh, the methodology, uh, well, I, I, I don't think I, I should mention anything uh, about this. So let me go to the, to the findings. Um, the first finding is that the US monetary policy affects emerging market economies through change in risk premia and foreign capital, but not necessarily in the risk-free rates. I find this very interesting because some models, for example, of sovereign default that I, that I'm more, uh, that, that I specialize in, they are sometimes looking more for change in risk-free in risk -free rates uh, so it's interesting to, 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 to find this. Uh, another, another thing that I find very interesting, I, I will say that this is the fact that I, that I found surprising and it's very, it's very nice, is that the, 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 the symmetric effect that you mentioned, that the, fa the fact that a tighter level of macroprudential regulation also lowers economic activity in good times. And this is very interesting because usually if I think about general equilibrium models that try to, to quantify the effects of optimal macroprudential regulations, they usually don't have this trade-off. And, and, and I believe that this is a very interesting, interesting finding to think more about how to introduce this, uh, this trade-off in a, in a framework, for example, like Bianchi 2011, who is like a framework that is usually used to, to study optimal macroprudential regulation. So another thing that I was, I was thinking about this is that basically what Katerina found is that macroprudential policy is also costly, right? So it will be interesting to see how other uh, alternative policies like accumulating international reserves uh, compare with this, uh, with this macroprudential policy. For, for example, there are some studies that shows that, that uh, accumulating reserves is an alternative as macroprudential policies. So it will be interesting to see how this, this, this two alternatives differ in their cost. Uh, I, I think this is something that I, I found very interesting. Uh, so in terms of uh, implications for monetary policy independence, this is very related with the paper by, by, by Christian. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm gonna wait to talk about this in the, in the paper by Christian. And as final comment, I, I will say that, that 
it is crucial to study this trade-off uh, for, for optimal macro potential policy. Uh, I think this finding, I, I don't know, Katerina, you maybe can tell me more about this, but I don't know if you are the first one documenting this. Uh, if you are, I think it, it will be super nice to keep like studying this. Um, and yeah, I, I think another important insight from the paper is that there is not only one, 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 one macro prudential policy, the one that can help us to, to damping against liquidity shocks, but it's like a broad range of macro prudential measures. Um, so yeah, I, I, will, I, will, I will end with this. And I just have to say that I really enjoyed the paper. I think it's written in a very clear way. And the, especially like this insight, I think it's pretty, pretty cool. So now let me go to the paper by Frederick, by, by Christian. Perfect. So the, 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 the question uh, from this paper is what is the impact of the global financial cycle on monetary policy independence? And more than the global financial cycle, uh, Christian and co-authors also develop a, a new measure, which is the strength of the global financial cycle. Uh, and they, they show that the impact of the global financial cycle on monetary policy independence depends on how stringent is the, is the, is the cycle. So what they found is that in, in when the global financial cycle is strength is low, then policy, res, policy rates respond to unanticipated increase in inflation. So they interpret this as a, a independent monetary policy. But when the global financial cycle strength is high, then there are, there are more constraints that, that do not allow the policy rates uh, to, to respond. So basically this was the conclusion of, of Christian. But in normal times, we, we are okay. We don't, we don't really, um, we, we don't need to get worried about monetary policy independence, but when the high global financial cycle uh, is strained, then we, we have to, to worry about this. Um, so the, the, the methodology, I don't know. I, I mean, again, I am not an applied macroeconomist, so I, I, I don't know how, how common is, is this kind of models. I've, I found it a little bit challenging to understand exactly what, what you were doing, uh, but, but then, then I think it, it, was, it was clear at the end. Um, I will say that what I understand are the main findings. Uh, is that one, that the strength of the global financial cycle varies a lot over time, but it's not only the, the cycle what matter, but also the strength of the cycle. And, and Christian also found that this variation is, is heterogeneous across countries. And he has not only emerging economies, but also advanced economies. And, and he found that that this strength of the cycle is, is, is pretty heterogeneous. So two questions that, that I have about this, the first one will be try to understand how relevant is this measure and what are the implications? This is something that, that I didn't, didn't get from the paper. Uh, so, I mean, maybe it's just because I don't really understand the literature, uh, but, but if not, maybe it will be a good idea uh, to try to elaborate a little bit more why this is important. Um, and, and another question that I have is that, how can we use this new measure? And actually this could answer the first question. How can we use this uh, new measure to inform about what is the optimal uh, 
monetary policy. And, and what I'm trying to say with this is that if we know that we are in times when the financial when the strength of the global financial cycle is high, then the, the monetary policy should be different from the one in times when the strength of the global financial cycle is low. But my question is, can we know exactly if we are in, in, in which of these states? This is, this is a question that I have for, for you, Christian. Um, then in terms of uh, implications for monetary policy, uh, the main finding is that central banks respond less to unexpected movements in inflation gap when the strength of the global financial cycle is high. So the point is that we found that in, in, in these times, the monetary policy is less independent. Um, fine, I, they, they explore different policy options. Uh, I will add, are you, con I mean, would you consider to study other uh, policies such as international reserves? For, for example, uh, as I mentioned before, there is a, a literature that, that studies uh, international reserves and, and uh, as a, a source of macro prudential policy or kind of macro prudential policy. So maybe it will be interesting to see uh, to also add this 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 uh, this measure to your study, and I th I think something that was very interesting is that macroprudential policy is the one showing uh, th that that showing that is effective not only for advanced but also for emerging economies, but also is the weakest among these three alternatives. So again, I think the insight from this is that we have to do even a better job studying uh, macro potential policies. And I think this is the main lesson I would say for from all the papers in this session. Um, and as a final comment, I would say that, um, yeah, the, the question that, that I already say that, that how can we use this new measure to inform a optimal monetary policy? And, and I will say that something that we really need to do is to understand what are the transmission channels and see how can exploit this measure of the strength of the global financial cycle and take it to the, to the, to the general equilibrium models on these capital flows. So I will conclude here uh, in case that, that either Katarina or Christian wants to, wants to talk a little bit more. Should I, should I start, Christian? Yes, sure, sure. Well, thanks so much for these thoughtful comments. Thanks for reading our paper. Um, you read it. Uh, you read it very well. I saw. Um, you read every detail, even the ones I didn't present, um, because I, I, I didn't present so much the comparison to the capital control, simply because it's. Um, I, I figured it was around 15 minutes the presentation, so um, I kept it to the macro prudential. You're very right. We find that everything I showed you today for cap uh, for macro prudential policies and how it's effective in buffering global financial shocks for emerging market. Um, is we do not find that for capital controls, which was a surprise to us, but um, but maybe another emphasis on how it is how important it is to strengthen the, the domestic financial stability uh, with macroprudential policy. Um, I take I take two points from you. They are very good. First, the trade off on how costly it is to tighten macroprudential regulation in good times when it might lower potential growth, and and that is absolutely true. However, do remember that in the medium to long term, overall it evens out. It does not lower average GDP growth. But you're right. In good terms, and you know the political economy comes in there as well. You know if there's an election, and in good times you don't want to. So, so you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right, and this is something one could go into. The other thing you mentioned is the optimal macroprudential policies, and this is the elephant in the room. I totally agree. 
Um, but I think this is for another paper. Um, and because we started to do it, it and to look at it, what is the optimal level? And then we try to just by describing what countries actually did, but uh, it is very complicated, even just evaluating how effective it was um, for, for a cross country study was very complicated. So this remains uh, definitely for, for further studies. Thank you so much for your comments again. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe uh, two, two minutes from my side. So yeah, thank you very much for, for reading the paper and uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, There's uh, very interesting things to think about. To, to address your kind of two main questions, I, I think the first one, why is this a relevant measure and can we show this? Like to some extent, that's kind of what we're trying to do when we put it in connection with monetary policy independence. So if that's like the variable that really tells apart whether um, central banks can move their policy rate in the, in the way they want it for domestic macroeconomic developments or not, like that seems to justify to some extent like a relevance that that's really a, a measure that, that can really make a difference in, in telling these two two reactions apart. The, the second point on the optimal monetary policy, I, I think that that's a very important one. I don't think we can really provide like a full answer there because if you have like two objectives, so one is you target your domestic macro objectives, the, the other one is maybe there's something else in, in times of crisis, you target the exchange rate or financial stability concerns, then you really need other types of policy tools, like for example, the market potential, for example, the capital controls, or you have some additional uh, tools, as you mentioned, the, the F, F, FX interventions. So I don't think we could easily provide like the optimal monetary policy response if there's like two, uh, I mean, could be still an optimal one, but it's it's not like in the optimal in the sense of first best uh, op optimal uh, from theoretical sense. But yeah, then that's a very interesting point to to think about further. If 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 you can say if if you have no other instruments, what should you do? On the um, uh, reserves, yeah, there was a lot of development in producing data and uh, uh, on FX interventions since we started the paper. So maybe that's something. I mean, surely it would fit in in the in the type of tools uh, over there. And that, that's a good point. We, we could try this out if, if we find the right data. And the last uh, point, very briefly, on how this could translate in, in the modeling world or in the theoretical world. So I think that that's kind of was on the on the first slide. My interpretation would be it's something like a financial friction in the in the borrowing constraint. Like you have the price times quantity. That's your global financial cycle. But this really tells you how this price times quantity translates into into your whatever beyond uh, on, on the left hand side so if you have this uh, financial uh, shock is, is is very high is, is very low it, it will tell you like how, how your burn constraint uh, changes over time or like relative to a given set of prices and, and quantities and macro potential policies capital controls can affect how this feeds through so that that would be my interpretation how it matches the, the theoretical one but thanks overall for a very interesting comment Thanks a lot uh, for, for the answer and thanks everyone for, for this session. It was super interesting and it was a pleasure to meet all of you. So I think we can conclude with this. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Guys, bye. bye. Greetings from London. Thank you, everyone.